Welcome back. Um, we'll begin our next uh, topic, which is the adult immunization schedule with Dr. Paul Hunter giving the introduction. Paul, please. Hi, good morning. I'm Paul Hunter. I'm a fam family physician from Wisconsin. I'm here to talk about the 2020 recommended immunization schedule for adults aged 11, uh, 11 19 years and older. Um, and uh, Dr. Mark Friedman will be following up after me. Um, the immunization schedules are a tapestry woven from the threads of all the individual recommendations that are voted on. And a quick way for clinicians and patients and uh, administrators to see what, uh, what individual people need and how to put all the pieces together. And that's part of the reason that we have so many people who are on our, uh, on our work group. Uh, there's myself and Dr. Ke uh, Kevin Alt, who you heard from a little bit earlier, and uh, liaison uh, representatives from a very wide group of people, uh, of uh, organizations, and consultants. And Dr. Mark Friedman is now um, the work group lead and replacing uh, Dr. David Kim, who uh, absconded off to Washington, D.C. Um, also, you can see that within the CDC, there are very, very many uh, contributors because we um, need to pull, pull all those threads together, and I really appreciate all of their um, uh, contributions. Um, the reason we're talking about um, the immunization schedule um, now is we do this every time this year. Um, we need the ACI approval for the proposed schedules necessary prior to the publication in the MMWR in February of 2020, which is when it comes out every year. I've already apologized in advance to the nurse midwives for leaving out the M on their abbreviation. Um, the um, organizations that also uh, approve this Proposed schedule prior to the publication include the American College of Physicians, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, or is it Congress now, I believe, and the American College of Nurse Midwives. Um, the new policy is not established in the proposed schedules, um, but we are trying to bring everything together and trying to make it look like it all agrees with each other as much as it can. Um, and the annual schedules reflect recommendations already approved by the ACIP. Um, in addition to trying to bring the threads together, we're trying to harmonize things between uh, the child and adolescent schedule and the adult schedules. Um, there'll be, um, in our presentation, uh, Dr. Uh, Friedman's presentation next, there'll be edits to all of the tables. There's been quite a vote, uh, a large number of votes we've had this year, as you might remember from our last meeting, which was a vote-a-thon. Um, and so we've had a lot to, to put together. Um, and there's also some new colors that we're going to be talking about. Um, there's also content changes to the notes. Um, as the previous uh, work group uh, chair said to me, I was the um, king of uh, footnotes. Now, they're not called footnotes anymore. They're just notes. So I guess I'm just the king of notes. Um, so we will have a discussion and a vote uh, after this, too, um, in separate parts. So I am done, and we are ready for the Dr. Friedman. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. Uh, good morning, everybody. So um, the 2020 adult immunization schedule um, has been updated to reflect recommendations published or voted upon uh, since um, October of 2018. And these changes include, um, number one, hepatitis A vaccination for all persons um, with HIV who are at least one year of age. Uh, number two, uh, HPV vaccination for all persons through age 26. Um, and uh, shared clinical decision-making for persons age 27 through 45 years of age. Um, three, there's updated language um, for MMR vaccination in healthcare workers. Four, um, there's the language on the shared clinical decision-making for PCV13 for immunocompetent persons uh, age 65 years of age and older. Um, then there's updated meningococcal recommendations uh, for meningococcal B vaccine, um, updated recommendations for the use of 
Tdap anytime Td is indicated, as was discussed in the previous um, session, and clarification of varicella uh, vaccine indications um, for adults with HIV infection. So um, what are the changes that impact multiple portions of the schedule? Um, they include um, updates to the schedule graphics and edits um, throughout the notes section. Um, and these changes were made to reflect updated recommendations to improve harmonization uh, between the child and the adolescent schedule and uh, to clarify some language from the previous schedule. Reading glasses are a new thing for me, so they just went away. So I'll start with the cover page of the adult schedule. Um, on the cover page, there were minor wording edits uh, were added to the footnote at the bottom that's highlighted in the red box. Um, and the, the updated language highlights uh, or clarifies the language that there is no need to restart or add doses uh, to a vaccine series if, the, if there are extended intervals between doses. Next, I'll highlight changes to Table 1, which is the recommended adult immunization schedule. Uh, this is a graphical representation of Figure 1, I'm sorry, Table 1. The tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis row now reads that TD or Tdap is an option for a booster every 10 years. As I mentioned, this was discussed in the earlier session. The HPV row is now combined into a single row for males and females, reflecting that HPV is now recommended for all adults through age 26 years of age. In addition, the blue color has been added to the row, indicating that HPV vaccination for persons 27 through 45 years of age is now based on shared clinical decision making. Within the pneumococcal conjugate row, the box for immunocompetent persons 65 years of age and older is now blue, indicating the updated recommendation for vaccination in this group is now based on shared clinical decision making. Within the meningococcal B row, a blue box has been added for those 19 to 23 years of age who are not at increased risk for meningococcal disease, reflecting the updated recommendation for vaccination in this group um, is based on shared clinical decision making. A blue footnote key has been added indicating that the blue color indicates the vaccine is recommended based on shared clinical decision making. And we made some minor uh, updates to the gray footnote key. The gray color now indicates that um, there is either no recommendation slash not applicable. Next, to highlight changes to table two, which is the medical uh, indication schedule. Again, uh, the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis row now reads TD or Tdap is an option anytime a tetanus booster uh, is recommended. The HPV row has been combined into a single row for both males and females, reflecting that HPV is now recommended for all adults through age 26. In the hepatitis A row, the box for all persons living with HIV who are at least one year of age, regardless of CD4 count, is now yellow, reflecting the new recommendation for this group. Lastly, the gray footnote has been updated here as well. The key now says that the gray color represents no recommendation slash not applicable. There are some content edits to review in the notes section that I'll go over. Within the hepatitis A note under special situations, an expanded definition of chronic liver disease that is harmonized with the hepatitis B definition in the schedule has been added um, as listed here. Additional indications for vaccination were added for persons with HIV infection and in settings for exposure as listed in the slide. And lastly, uh, clotting factor disorders has been removed as an indication uh, for hepatitis A vaccination.
for HPV vaccination. Um, within the HPV note under routine vaccination, uh, you can see now that HPV rac vaccination is recommended for all adults through age 26 years, and it would be a two or three dose series depending on the age at initiation or the um, underlying medical condition. Under special situations for persons aged 27 through 45 years of age, vaccination may be considered based on shared clinical decision making. And this would be a two or three dose series, uh, again, as previously stated. Within the influenza note, under special situations, language for when uh, LAIV is contraindicated has been reformatted into a bulleted list as shown, and this harmonizes with the child schedule. Language for vaccinating persons with the history of Guillain-Barre syndrome within six weeks of a previous dose of influenza vaccine now reads that these persons generally should not be vaccinated unless the vaccination benefits outweigh the risks for those at higher risk for severe complications of influenza. Within the measles, mumps, and rubella note, under special situations, language for healthcare personnel has been clarified with separate bullets, the first bullet for those born in 1957 or later with no evidence of immunity to measles, mumps, or rubella, and then a separate bullet for those born before 1957 with no evidence to, of immunity. Within the meningococcal note, under special, special situations for meningococcal B, um, we added uh, the new complement inhibitor uh, ravulizumab to the list of indications for vaccination and added guidance for a meningococcal B booster dose one year after primary series completion and then also to revaccinate those persons every two to three years if they have ongoing risk to reflect the new recommendations. And we added uh, updated recommendations for adolescents and young adults who are not at increased risk for meningococcal disease to be vaccinated based on shared clinical decision making um, as listed on the slide here. Within the pneumococcal note, under routine vaccination, immunocompetent adults 65 years of age or older should receive one dose of, of the polysaccharide or PPSV23 vaccine. Uh, one dose of the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine or PCV13 is recommended based on shared clinical decision making. So the order has been changed to read PPSV23 first. Uh, however, the spacing of vaccines um, has not been changed and is listed on the slide. Um, within the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis note under routine vaccination, for those who previously did not receive Tdap at or after 11 years of age, um, the recommendation is to administer one dose Tdap, and then administer TD or Tdap every 10 years. Under special, under special situations, for those who previously did not receive primary vaccination series for tetanus, diphtheria, or pertussis, um, administer at least one dose of Tdap, followed by one dose TD or Tdap at least four weeks after the Tdap and then administer another dose of TD or Tdap six to 12 months after the last TD or Tdap uh, dose. Uh, again, Tdap can be substituted for any TD, do TD dose, but it's still preferred as the first dose. And then um, additional language to indicate that TD or Tdap can be used uh, every 10 years thereafter. Uh, also, um, the information for the use of TD or Tdap as tetanus prophylaxis um, <clears throat> the link has been updated. Within the varicella note, under special situations, uh, for persons with HIV infection with CD4 counts of at least 200 cells per microliter with no evidence of immunity, vaccination may be considered, and it would be two doses uh, administered three months apart. And that's just a clarification of the previous language. So that's all I have. Um, we are now open for discussion. Thank you.
So uh, the adult immunization schedule is open for discussion and questions. Just to note um, that the suggested changes for diphtheria do not go into effect on Tdap. Sorry, do not go into uh, effect until the vote uh, this afternoon if it is approved. Any questions or comments from the inner table? Dr. Bernstein. Can you go uh, to slide 26? That's two. I, I was wondering whether the bolded text, whether it previously did not receive primary vaccination series for tetanus, diphtheria, or pertussis, rather than end pertussis, unless that's saying the same thing. Let me see. Check what I have in the full notes. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, yes, uh, Ms. McNally. I would just like to thank you for the additional color uh, to the schedule, as I think that it adds the clarity uh, for consumers. <coughs> so. Sorry, for the for Dr. Bernstein's question, um, the language does use the word and. I will verify whether that should be and or or. I'll check with Dr. Havers. Dr. Lee. So first, I want to thank the work group for um, taking what turns out to be a very complex set of recommendations and trying to distill it, because I think now it's becoming clear to me that the adult immunization schedule is becoming increasingly complex. Um, so you did a really amazing job, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, one of the things that I'm challenged by, and uh, so would completely agree with all the recommendations, but I'm still struggling a little bit with the implementation challenges. Um, and partly it's not so much table one, it's really table two for me. Um, thinking about if I'm a provider who uh, predominantly sees end-stage renal disease or might only see chronic liver disease patients, how do we help our subspecialists who might be seeing these populations more frequently than we do to help to vaccinate and make sure these um, individuals are up to date? I don't have a good answer, but I wanted to raise that the complexity, uh, the, the complexity of the schedule itself and trying to distill it in such a simple way, it's still complicated to interpret. The, going across, I really appreciate the notes because I think from a vaccine-specific standpoint, it's clear what the recommendations are. Um, but I think from a population standpoint, it, be, it becomes a little confusing for subspecialists who are caring for these populations. And I really want to figure out how we can partner with them to best protect these populations. Thank you for those comments. Questions? Anybody else? Uh, yes, Dr. Sanchez. It's more of a question with the um, inactivated flu vaccine with the um, live, um, uh, LIAIV. Mm -hmm. um, the contraindication in the cochlear implant population, can you comment on that? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. So one of the, um, it said cochlear implants, that it was a precaution or, or not to be used? And let me see. LAIV Sorry, can you repeat should the question? not be used cochlear implants. And I was just wondering where, what's the date on that? And can you answer your question into the microphone? Because so Dr. Sanchez is asking a question about LAIV and its use in individuals or recommendation that it not be used in individuals with LAIV. This has been a, a yeah, topic of discussion in the implants. past, but if you could please offer comment on that. Dr. Robinson is going to yeah. answer that. Go ahead, please. Hi, yes. So um, there are some conditions outlined in the influenza notes that are not technically contraindications or precautions, but there is a lack of data on the use of that vaccines in persons with that condition. And I believe cochlear implants is one of those groups that fall into that paragraph. So we specifically use the language in the note that these are situations um, under which, I believe it's like under which LAIV should not be used. And we don't turn them contraindications or precautions because they are not labeled contraindications or precautions, but the data uh, is not clear for the use in those populations. Thank you very much. Dr. Admar. I, I had uh, similar concerns about some of the other groups, um, the asplenia, and, and in the um, guidance from, from, uh, that was published earlier this year, it notes that, uh, I guess, IDSA has made recommendations about some of these risk groups and that 
that ACIP was gathering further information, but it says contraindicated and um, rather than precaution, and uh, I'm bothered by that, I guess. So just to clarify, um, the, the language that will be in the schedule uh, is as on the slide here, LAIV should not be used. Um, I used the term contraindication in my discussion, which was sort of misuse of that word. Um, I should have said situations where it's not recommended to be used. It's not listed as a specific contraindication. And so I know on the table, it appears as red, um, which was why for the legend in the table for the red, um, particularly you'll notice it's on the child and adolescent schedule, it says contraindication or should not be used because we did not want to introduce a new color to represent should not be used. Um, so we have, and we can make sure that uh, we, we added it to the adult schedule as well. So we're specific that the color represents both of those scenarios. Doctor, is this a continuation of your first question? It's Dr. a continuation. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Adler. So, So in fact, the guidance in, in the flu recommendations does not say it should not be used. It notes that there have been concerns raised by other groups, but it does not say should not be used. Dr. Kroger, do you want to ask for comment? Hi, yes. Uh, Andrew Kroger, uh, CDC, uh, Communication Education Branch. Um, right, conditions that are contraindications also should not be used. They are labeled specifically as contraindications. Uh, pregnancy is another one specifically with LAIV. Uh, so uh, it does make sense that both conditions are listed on the, on the schedule, but we can double check with influenza subject matter experts to make sure that our list is complete. What does it say in this the flu statement? It's a, Doc, is this what it says in the Go ahead, doctor. So for the flu statement, pregnancy is a contraindication and uh, cochlear implant is should not be used. Dr. Help if we change the notes so that it's clearer which of these things are contraindications and which of them are should not be used? Is that what you're asking for, more precision in the language? I'm not, I'm not sure sort of specifically, you know, what direction to go. Uh, Dr. Talbot, then Dr. Hunter, and then Dr. Baker. Dr. Talbot. I'm going to be right on your line, so you're okay. Um, so I think the concern is that there are healthcare workers who refuse to get needles. Um, and LAIV is a major way that many hospitals vaccinate healthcare workers. So if they have any of these that we don't have enough data on or it's a precaution and you put a big red box, there's no OCK Health that's going to give LAIV to that person who's a healthcare worker. So I think an orange box would be the answer. Dr. Massigny. So your issue is not, the, I mean, your issue is how we're translating what's in the flu statement into this table and that the red color is a, a problem. We probably can't use orange because orange is precautions, which actually also doesn't really reflect the same thing as what they're saying. So I think if we follow this line, we need another color. Is that, I mean, is that where we're going? I'm just trying to translate this directly. Yeah, I mean, we could do something similar, like we could do orange with the dots or something like that so that it's not a new color, but it does um, add that it's, it's different. Again, this is adding to the complexity of the reading of this document. And I just say that as, as chair here, I think I'm reflecting what a lot of us are thinking about it, that not all this information can be transmitted through the table alone, that the notes uh, are, are, are an integral part of this uh, so, uh, Dr. Hunter, your comment. Yeah, I was just making sure that we were talking about how to translate what's already written in something we voted on into what it looks like on the paper, rather than trying to go back to change what the actual recommendation is. And it, I got that clarified. And we're, we're on the right track. Dr. Baker, if you would. I think I heard somebody say the IDSA agrees with contraindication for cochlear implants. I am unaware that that is true, um, and I agree with the conversation that, that's being had. I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but a contraindication 
should be an immune compromised person and we assume pregnant women are that fine, fine, fine for live vaccines because of the theoretical risk. But for cochlear implants or even a splenia for flu vaccine, I think we need to, to, if there's contraindication, it should be contraindication. Otherwise it should be a precaution with dots or whatever you do, but I, I think it would really send the wrong message we, and we should make whatever the current 2020 statement for flu vaccine should be consistent with the table. Dr. Sanchez. No, I just want to agree with that because to me, should not be used is, is a contraindication. And I, I just, and I don't, it makes no sense. If we don't have the data, that's something that should be stated rather than contraindication. Dr. Massonier. I just want to go back to what Dr. Hunter said. Um, this is about translating what you all have already voted on into a statement, and Dr. Bernstein just gave me the specific table which perhaps we can get for you all because in the flu statement, table two, LA, under LAIV, there's a column that says contraindications and conditions for which use is not recommended, and that's exactly what it says. And so if you want to change those things from conditions for which vaccine is not recommended, we would need to go back and re-vote on the flu statement, which is not up for consideration today. So we can do that, but you kind of can't do that today because you can't change it from a precaution, from a condition for which vaccines should not be used to a precaution in the schedule. It does, it says. Use your microphone, please. Uh, there's a variety of conditions for which it says this, right? So maybe again, as a point of order, perhaps we could pause, get this language sort of around so folks could see it and then maybe they could compare that with this because not everybody is looking at the same thing that we are. Very good. Dr. Weber. Dr. Weber. Uh, I heard both on the first slide and in this discussion people using the term healthcare workers and healthcare personnel interchangeably. So we feel strongly that the correct term is healthcare personnel because we need to remember that students and volunteers are not workers and we do believe in protecting them as well. So, uh, our, and the ACIP in general has adopted uh, that term of healthcare personnel. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Just to um, address Dr. Massonier's comments, I'm wondering if we could change the red box to say contraindicated or not recommended, because that's what you have down below. But maybe just having that or not recommended would help with that. That's just one suggestion. Um, the second is, I struggle a little bit, and I understand the rationale why, but flipping between tables one and two, which I imagine some people will do, um, the, there's, it's clear that the yellow are universally recommended vaccines by age group or by condition. Um, but the purple, because it's the same color, it gets a little confusing if you're trying to go back and forth between the two because you realize it's um, a risk-based condition or a high-risk condition in table one. And in table two, it's a additional risk-based condition for purple in table two. And so I worry that some people might go back and forth and it might take them a second to realize that you have to have, for example, if you have end-stage renal disease and diabetes, um, that you would default to the yellow, if that makes sense. So that's my other question. And then the third um, uh, point of clarification, and I don't know if this goes against basic <laughs> principles for how to develop this table, but um, on the, the, with the adult pneumococcal vaccine, vaccine recommendations, um, they are some of the more complex ones, I will admit. Um, and uh, I realize that unlike the other vaccines, we do recommend this in series. So the PCV13 plus PPSV23 for people um, at high risk. Uh, or PPSV23 if you have a risk condition. And I'm wondering if it helps to clarify those two options. Uh, so in, in instead of just having PCV, having P PCV13 plus PPSV23 for one line and then PPSV23 for the second line. Um, because it is a little confusing, I think, to the average practitioner. Thank you for those thoughts. Anyone else with comment that I missed? I Dr. Hunter and then Dr. Massonier. Sure, I'm just trying to figure out, Grace, are you, so you're not saying on PCV that you add a third line, you would just change the second line to a combination. That's a very interesting idea. Um, 
If I could go back to your previous comment about um, uh, specialists looking down the, the vertically on table two, um, I would be very happy if they were doing that and that they were, um, a specialist were vaccinating more than they are, um, and if they were looking at this schedule in general. Um, I think that uh, the overwhelming majority of people who have specialist indications um, are getting their vaccines in primary care and public health settings. Um, and I think that uh, that's a struggle that we who do education of clinicians um, reach. And it's, and it's not a pro, it's a systemic issue from my uh, understanding of the limited understanding I have of it in that it's very hard to carry vaccines. Um, just ask people who do it in private mm -hmm. practice. Um, and when that's not the majority of what you do, um, it's hard for a specialist to keep that in mind. And I think that uh, uh, those of us in primary care, it's what we do. So I, I, I hear what you're saying about the, the, um, the vertical part of things, but um, I, I don't see a quick way of doing that right now, personally. So. Dr. Messonnier. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that we've tried to work on in the past couple of years within ACIP is to differentiate your role from the role of the people who need to implement these recommendations. And some of you, because of your jobs, cross those lines because you're also implementing. Um, I think the schedule is a place where we see this tension because you all are trying to fit the schedule into a way that gets towards implementation. And we completely appreciate all the feedback. Um, I'm not sure that we can arbitrate this around the schedule itself, but we completely recognize this complexity and the schedule is getting more complex, decision making is getting more complex, and we at CDC and all of our implementation partners around the room need to get more sophisticated at providing the tools that clinicians need so that it makes it easy for them to do the right thing. That being said, one of the tensions about some of the things that you're asking us is that on one hand, you want us to simplify the schedule, but on the other hand, some of the things that you're asking us to do are gonna make it more complex. So a specific question, maybe before we get to a vote kind of thing is, we could add to the box that says contraindicated the same language that's on the footnote that says contraindicated or not recommended. It would make the words in that box squishier. <laughs> but if you want us to do that and you think that that's a better conveyance of what you mean, we'll do it. But I guess it just would be helpful to hear if folks agree with the direction that Grace is going and that Kip brought up that that word contraindicated is going to be such a impediment to clinicians that it's worth the extra complexity to add more words into the box. Because again, we could do it. Um, I just, I'm not sure where y'all are going with this. So let me, let me add comment to that, which is sitting on the, uh, the child adolescent immunization uh, work group and previous chair of it, it, we were tasked with stripping it to, to make it as compact as possible. And, and we spent a period of time and are still spending a period of time to do that. Now you're asking us to expand it again and fill the void that we have created by cutting down on the verbiage. So, so keep that in mind. It's, it, we, it's not, you can't have it both ways. You have to make a decision of what you want. Um, so go ahead. So I believe uh, Dr. Lee and then Dr. Fry and then Dr. Atmar, but Dr. Lee. Okay. You never thought colors were gonna cause so much controversy, but here we go. <laughs> um, I actually, uh, well, I won't comment on the other point you brought up, but I guess I just wanna make the general statement that I think that um, as we continue to uh, delve into more complex recommendations over time, and this just, it just, it used to be simpler 15 years ago, and now it just feels like every recommendation we make, it's not easy. Um, and we especially make it difficult for our implementation partners. So I take your point about the distinction between recommendations and implementation. I will say, though, that I think that there are many missed opportunities we have, because sometimes uh, for some of these high-risk populations we're delving into, our subspecialists are actually have multiple points of contact with them that I think are, they don't actually necessarily see primary care, and sometimes there's also a reluctance if there's not a good understanding um, 
of where they are in their course of their disease, um, and I'll bring up congenital heart disease as one of the challenges, um, that these kids can go under vaccinated for a long period of time. So I, I think just in general, as we start to move into this more complex era, I would push us to start to think about how we can avoid those missed opportunities. And part of that relates to the implementation section of our evidence to recommendation framework. But I completely hear your point, Dr. Massonier. Dr. Fry. I'm going to pass. I think I just answered my own question. <laughs> Dr. Admar. I, I think the issue, I'm, I'm not asking for it to be more complicated. I think the issue is the disagreement as to what the recommendations actually say as it relates to LAIV. And, and you know, I looked at the table, I looked at the text of the recommendations, and some of these groups are, um, the, the actual language says, because there are no data, we recommend RIV4 or IV for these patients. It doesn't say it's not indicated um, specifically. And, and, you know, as was Dr. Talbot brought up, there might be some circumstances where an injection may not be uh, uh, desired by the recipient. And, it is an option, and there's not, it's not a safety issue. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hunter, please. So I'd just like to reiterate, in my understanding and experience, um, subspecialists are not carrying vaccines in their practices and are generally not vaccinating. Uh, that's not true. So speaking as a subspecialist, I will tell you that every child that shows up in our clinic has an extensive review of their immunizations based on the state health immunization record. And those vaccines that are deficient or uh, are available for that child at that age are given. Um, so I can say that at least for my subspecialty, and I had Grace uh, nodding her head, we do look at this very carefully. Our next, pa our next uh, person is Dr. Middleman, please. Um, Middleman from um, Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. I, I um, don't usually look at the adult schedule, so I want to um, make that clear from the beginning. But, but in Table 1, if this is really truly harmonized with the way that the child and adolescent schedule works, for me it's very um, difficult to understand how an annual flu vaccine that should be given to everyone is the same color as a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, which is essentially what we would consider in child and adolescence a catch-up vaccine recommendation. So for me, the fact that there's no distinction between what we should be giving on a routine basis to adults versus what we're giving for somebody who perhaps hasn't had a vaccine or lacks documentation of a vaccine is really problematic and really does separate the use of this from the use of the child and adolescent schedule. And so I think that it would be important to go through and really rethink the use of the colors and the legends at the bottom. Because if you also look at table two, um, you'll note that the bottom purple says recommended vaccination for adults with an additional risk factor. Does that mean an additional risk factor to diabetes if you're looking at diabetes? Or does it mean with that risk factor? So the, the, the way the legends work and the colors work, I think, could be clarified. So um, I'll just respond. You know, we, this, is, this comes up every couple of years, as m many of you who have been here for a long time know. And I think that that's, these are all really good points. I think it can be hard sometimes when we're only talking about this in October um, to then decide on the schedule for the next year. And so one of the things we can think about doing next year is talking about some of these issues in prior meetings so that these can be more discussed and resolved prior to the next schedule. And that's um, definitely something we can move forward with. Yeah, an excellent an I think excellent that's a great suggestion. idea. Dr. Bell. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to this question, this tension between increasing complexity, missed opportunities, 
um, and simplification and just make the obvious point that what we're looking at here is a piece of paper. And while it's important, we, you, know, you know that the piece of paper is very important, it hangs up all over the place in the bulletin boards, um, it just occurs to me that on, as somebody, on somebody's phone or tablet, there are many more opportunities to make our message clearer and avoid missed opportunities. And perhaps, you know, one of the things for the future might be some ways to more explicitly direct people to tools that can reflect this kind of complexity without us tying ourselves into knots and standing on our heads when we're looking at this piece of paper. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Dr. Goldman. Thank you. So when I approach these things, I look at both the public health aspect of it as well as the individual practitioner. And if for those of us in individual private practice who want to vaccinate patients, we're going to learn the schedule. We're going to know the schedule and understand what we do. So we want to, from the public health perspective, make it as easy as possible, but we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We need to know that those who want to vaccinate and engage in a vaccine program are going to learn the schedule. I find this very useful. I think for, you know, after the learning curve, it's easy to read, it's digestible, we know what we're doing for those of us who are vaccinating, and I think it's good the way it is because those who want to learn it will learn it. As far as private practice, primary care versus specialist, again, it goes back to, you know, the public health and a system approach versus the individual. You know, I'm I'm not finding that my nephrologists are vaccinating, but the dialysis centers are. So it comes down to a question of what systems are in place. The health system will learn it and vaccinate from the specialty perspective, but not necessarily the individual specialist. So, you know, for the bottom line, those of us who engage in a vaccine program are going to learn the schedule. I think it, it is going to be a learning curve. We can't just spoon feed everyone. They have to be able to understand it, digest it. And I think this, uh, after years of experience with it, is very digestible, and I really like the way it's laid out. Thank you, Dr. Freihoff. Sandra Freihoff for American Medical Association, speaking as a, a practicing physician. Uh, I want to compliment the work group on all the time that went into coming up with the schedule. And um, the way I look at this is the table is something, the schedule is something to draw you in. It's like, as you said, a one page sort of cheat sheet, it's not the end all. You go to the notes. After the notes, you go to the full recommendation. So that information is there. If you add too much um, writing on that schedule, people are just gonna not even go there and we're going to defeat the purpose. Uh, and as, as Jason mentioned, he's also a practicing physician. You know, there are lots of people that are taking care of the patient that are immunizing. Just a plug for everyone to please put their immunizations into the immunization schedule so everyone can be on the same page and know what our patients do need. And uh, back to Dr. Middleman's comment about the, um, when she mentioned the flu shot and MMR, I still have patients that come in that didn't get vaccinated with MMR, and I have mainly an adult practice. So I think having it in yellow is just a reminder that this is something important that people need. But I'm with you. Everyone six months and older needs flu shot every year. And Dr. Atmar, I agree with you. We need to get those um, details about the LAIV um, worked out. As a, as a practicing doc, I don't want to, we have standing orders for flu vaccination in my office. I do not want to give a patient the wrong vaccine and have a problem. But we would, I as a, as a practicing doc would really appreciate clarification on that. I don't think that this schedule today is the time to do it though. Thank you very much for those comments. Dr. Bernstein. Yeah, I, I just wanted to echo uh, and, and, and remember that the, the adult schedule and the child and adolescent schedule are trying to translate the actual policy. They are not creating policy. And so to echo what Dr. Atmar said, it is important that whatever language contraindications or precautions around LAIV, for example, we should use what the language that's specifically in the current flu policy, and we'll make sure that that happens. That's very important. As a minor thing, can you go to slide 24, please? 
So I am not an adult doctor, but for me, um, the top part says 65 and older, one dose is recommended, one dose of 13 is recommended on shared clinical decision making. For me, I think it's important that that third bullet actually be the first bullet, rather than say that if both are to be administered, give the PCV uh, 13 first. I think first you should say they shouldn't be administered at the same visit, and they need to be a year apart and blah, the, the PCV13 should be given first. That's, just, that's my simplification. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Messonnier. Yeah, trying to move us forward. Um, it sounds like the biggest tension is around the language of the LAIV, and I don't see the, the flu work group chair in the room. So Jessica, can you please call them and get them here and let us, while we're in between, check the language and make sure that we can justify the way that it is specifically, because I just feel like we don't have the right people in the room. My second question is to the question of the schedule. Can you go back to your um, table uh, two? So, um, you know, one of the things we try to do is harmonize the childhood and adult schedule. And in thinking about this question of whether the word contraindicated on the schedule is disconcerting. I looked to see what the childhood schedule said, and it turns out that in the childhood schedule, table three, there aren't any words. The ju justification is perhaps that these groups didn't completely harmonize, or maybe it's also that the childhood schedule, actually table three, is a little more, um, the boxes are smaller, so they didn't have space. But can, would you guys prefer that we took the words off of this one? Because um, it would be then harmonized and maybe it would give us more of a chance to direct people to look at the actual language underneath which makes a clearer case for that it's contraindicated or not recommended and maybe we'll even switch the order of that so it starts with not recommended. So would that help? Okay. Dr. Talbot. Because it would help a lot and, and as long as it's truly contraindicated if it's read. Thank you. Are there any other comments, questions? Uh, Dr. Uh, Hunter. I would recommend that we keep in the um, text in the yellow and purple boxes, however, because that prevents people having to go to the notes. So, uh, yes, Dr. Hunter. I would wonder if we could, before we vote on this later this afternoon, see all those changes um, and review them. Yeah. Okay. Will there be like enough we time? Usually do. Sorry, to taking that forward, will there be enough time to have those changes made? We we could also change this vote to tomorrow morning if they need additional that time. That may be that may be a better idea. I think if we if we postpone the vote. So tomorrow morning, do we need a motion I, for that or just leave it the way it is? I just feel more comfortable if we actually were voting on what we could actually yeah, see. I, I think that's right. Then, then, then the committee can actually take a look at what the product will be. Okay, very good. So now hopefully we'll move on to the less contentious, gentler <laughs> childhood immunization <laughs> schedule. With the, the child one first. Yes, right. Uh, uh, with a, an introduction by Dr. Bernstein. easier living in a child's world. So I plan to give uh, a brief introduction for the 2020 Child and Adolescent Immunization Schedule uh, work group. The work group has four ACIP members. Besides myself, Dr. Kathy Paling, Dr. Jose Romero, and Dr. Peter Solaji. 
I would like to acknowledge our multiple liaison representatives who are listed on the left side of this slide. They're incredibly helpful, as are our work group consultants and our CDC lead, Candace Robinson, who again makes us look good. And here are the uh, multiple people that we should acknowledge, our multiple CDC contributors, and all of them really uh, help us tremendously in making this schedule easy to use at point of care, which is the purpose uh, for putting the schedule together. But now I'd like to take a pause. I'd like to make a pause. And uh, I wanted to thank and congratulate Dr. Ray Strickis. We want to recognize uh, one of our CDC contributors, Dr. Ray Strickis, who is retiring later this year. In his over 30 year career, Dr. Strickis has had the opportunity to work on many different subject areas. Lucky for us, he has worked with this ACIP for the last seven years. During this time, he served as CDC lead for the child and adolescent immunization schedule for two years, was a contributing member of the adult immunization schedule, Zoster, and pneumococcal work groups, and briefly served as acting ACIP secretariat. Dr. Strickis, it has been a great working with you, and we wish you the best in your retirement going forward. So I'd like to, uh, as chair, uh, exercise a point of personal privilege. Um, so I had the privilege of learning of Dr. Strickis in 1986 when I was uh, a fellow in the, in the laboratory of a polio virologist. Um, and Dr. Strickis's original first paper out of the CDC has uh, stood the test of time. Um, this report was a 14-year survey of polio virus and non-polio non enteroviruses by the CDC. Um, it characterized the epidemiology both temporally and geographically of enteroviral infections in the United States. It served and still serves today as the reference point for this particular topic um, and is cited over in many, many articles, both uh, in my articles and other articles, um, and is a major, I think, contribution to the epidemiology of this disease. It's very germane today uh, in, the, in, in, in the face of the uh, acute, uh, of the AFM uh, epidemic we're having, or resurgence we're having right now. So again, thank you, Ray, for everything you've done. Thank you for, for the work that you've contributed. Uh, we, are, we really appreciate it. You have left a lasting legacy. Next slide, please. Thanks again, Ray, and we do wish you the best. So returning back to the child and adolescent schedule, I would like to remind you that I need to go forward on the slides. So I'd like to remind you that the committee and, and the audience, why we present the schedule for a vote every fall. The ACIP's approval is necessary prior to the publication of the schedule in February of the following year. ACIP approval is necessary before we have our partners AAP, AAFP, ACOG, and ACNM review and approve the schedule. Of note, this is the first year that the ACNM will be listed as an approving organization for the child and adolescent schedule, and we welcome them and their input. Finally, no new policy is established by this schedule. Rather, it reflects a summary of ACIP recommendations. That's very important to uh, keep in mind. With the adolescent, uh, child and adolescent schedule, there are multiple edits to all the tables and content changes or clarifying edits for multiple notes have been uh, included. Dr. Robinson will discuss the proposed edits for this 2020 schedule. These edits are intended to incorporate ACIP recommendations and MMWR publications that have occurred since October of 2018. 
and improve the readability and utility of the schedule into language that is easy to use at point of care by the busy provider. The following presentation will highlight proposed edits to Table 1, Table 2, and Table 3, as well as content changes and clarifying edits for multiple notes as listed on this slide. This session will conclude with a discussion of the proposed edits, followed by a vote on the adult schedule and the child and adolescent uh, schedule as in the agenda. I'll now ask Dr. Robinson to take us through each of the proposed edits in the schedule. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a list of ACIP votes relevant to the child and adolescent schedule uh, that have occurred since October of 2018, um, that meeting at the ACIP. Uh, content edits based on recent votes for hepatitis A, men B, and uh, pending votes for Tdap vaccines um, uh, were discussed uh, by the work group and incorporated into the presentation today. Uh, and clarifying edits uh, for the influenza note were also incorporated into the proposed schedule. In addition, edits were made to the tables and notes of other vaccines as needed for clarity. On the cover page, uh, the American College of Nurse Midwives has been added as an approving organization for the child and adolescent immunization schedule as mentioned by Dr. Bernstein. Within table one, uh, this is the proposed table one for the 2020 immunization schedule. In the hepatitis A row, the bar representing vaccination for those two through 18 years of age has been changed from a split purple and green bar to a solid green bar. This denotes the recommendation for routine catch hepatitis A catch-up vaccination for all children and adolescents through 18 years of age. The men B row has been moved down in the, tab in the table to appear just above the, uh, sorry, the men ACWY row has moved down in the table to appear just above the men B row. Within the legend, the text for the blue box and gray boxes have been edited. Uh, the blue box text now reads recommended based on shared clinical decision making. And for the gray box, the phrase not applicable has been added to the text. And this harmonizes this text between the adult and child and adolescent schedule. This is the proposed 2020 table two. There is one minor edit for this table. ACWY has been added next to the appearance of the words meningococcal in this table. And that is to clarify that these catch up recommendations are for men ACWY vaccines only and not for men B vaccines. I will now review the relevant edits to the notes section. Oh, sorry. I will now discuss table three. <laughs> Within table three, uh, the hepatitis A bar has been changed to all yellow. And that is to denote that vaccination is recommended for all persons irrespective of their medical conditions. The men ACWY row uh, has also been moved in this table to mirror the move in the table one. Additionally, the box in the pregnancy row has been changed from purple to yellow. Uh, this is to indicate that pregnancy is not a reason to withhold vaccination in an adolescent and routine vaccination should be administered if indicated for pregnant women. Lastly, on this table, uh, the text not applicable has been added to the gray box for consistency with the table one text. Now, I will review the relevant edits to the note section. Within the DTAP note, language has been added to clarify the circumstances under which the fifth dose of DTAP is not uh, needed. The addition of the highlighted language is also harmonized with similar language that appears in other notes with similar uh, vaccine catch-up guidance, including the polio note. 
within the hymno, a bullet has been added to clarify that catch-up vaccination is not needed for previously unvaccinated children aged 60 months and older not at high risk of hip disease. Within the hepatitis A note, a bullet has been added to the catch-up vaccination section to reflect the recommendation for routine catch-up vaccination for, of all children and adolescents 2 through 18 years of age who are not previously vaccinated with hepatitis A vaccine. Additionally, the special situation section has been removed as all persons uh, through 18 years of age are recommended to receive vaccination uh, irrespective of other conditions. Within the hepatitis B note, a special situation section has been added. This section outlines the groups for whom revaccination may be recommended and refers to the hepatitis B ACIP recommendations for additional details. The influenza note has been reformatted to more clearly present the recommendations uh, for children who are recommended to receive two doses of influenza vaccine and which children are recommended to receive one dose of influenza vaccine in a particular season. We will put a pause in this language for the LAIV note. Within the special situation section of the MIN ACWY note, the term complement inhibitor use will now be used where relevant to refer to all medications in the class of medications such as ecluzumab and ravulizumab. Also, information has been added to this section which outlines the recommendations for adolescent vac vaccination of children who received men ACWI prior to age 10 years. The sub-bullets outline the recommendations for children in whom booster doses are not recommended and those in whom booster doses are recommended. Within the MIN-B notes, a reference to the MMWR publication for the booster dose recommendations for meningococcal B vaccine has been added. This harmonizes the presence of similar recommendations uh, in the MIN-ACWI note. The inactivated polio virus vaccination note has been renamed polio virus vaccination, as the note also contains information regarding OPV. Uh, the note will be moved to the appropriate alphabetical place within the note section. In addition, detailed information regarding which doses of OPV can count as TOPV has been added. Within the TDAP note, or Tdap has been added as a placeholder um, as a vaccine option for booster doses. This is of course pending vote by ACIP and same for the adult language, it will be included if voted on by ACIP. Finally, clinical guidance for children who receive Tdap or DTAP between seven to 10 years of age has been added to the note as mentioned in the earlier Tdap session by Dr. Havers. And at this time, we'll open up this presentation for a discussion. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Members of the voting committee, do you have any comments? Dr. Bernstein. I'm sorry, forgive, forgive me. I was looking at you. We're interchangeable primary care physicians. Um, so uh, if I'm, yeah, it's your beard. Um, forgive me. <laughs> uh, I'm, just looking at uh, the adult uh, immunization schedule and seeing that pregnancy men ACWY is purple, um, and you're changing that box in the ch child uh, schedule from purple to yellow? Yes, so um, for children, we have a routine recommendation for men ACWI oh. at adolescent age. And so uh, in those instances, pregnancy would not be considered uh, a reason to withhold the vaccination. However, for adults, uh, there is no routine men ACWI recommendation. It is all indications based, so which is why there's to, purple you in You want to make it yellow so you make sure they, 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 the routine one gets done. Yes. I see. Thank mm -hmm. you. Dr. Pelling. 
Uh, thank you for this um, presentation. I really liked in table three how you put the Meninge ACWY and B together. My question is, what, um, would it be possible to put hepatitis A and B together in this table? So, oops, wrong way. So I will note that for table, the, the order of table three is based on the order of table one. And ah. the reason why we have men, uh, men, not men B, hepatitis B and hepatitis A separated is that uh, the goal was to kind of have this progression in the yellow boxes okay. from the first recommended vaccine mm -hmm. and then down through to the adolescent so you could follow along from left to right. Um, okay. So that's why we have it, although uh, certainly if, if persons are passionate, we can consider moving uh, hepatitis B. But that's why we have it that way. Thank you. Dr. Talbot. Mine's going to be very similar to Dr. Paling's because I would have, um, on table three, put Tdap right under Dtap um, just so that you know when you change based on the medical condition. But I guess it'll mess up table one. <laughs> Dr. Bell. Um, at the risk of getting thrown out of the room here. Just going back to Grace's point about the difficulty in the adult schedule on table two, uh, the people with the conditions. Um, I know that there are lines, longitudinal lines, down on table three, uh, and I'm just wondering if we could do that in the adult schedule. At least then you could look down your column a little bit more easily. Thank you for that Take suggestion. That to the I gave you a thumbs up from uh, Dr. Friedman. <laughs> Dr. Eckert. Yes, I wanted to ask about the shared clinical decision making for HPV vaccine for nine year olds. So, for on table one, originally when we introduced a box for nine to 10 year olds, we just introduced a purple box, which was the recommendation for a high risk child, which, uh, of course, as we know, for HPV, those who have been victims of sexual abuse or assault are, are definitely recommended to receive it at nine to 10. However, we got feedback that that didn't, it also made it seem like you could not use it routinely in nine year olds, which uh, the HPV notes are clear that you can start the series at age nine uh, if indicated. So this box was placed um, to um, denote that you don't have to have that high risk indication to start it at age nine, um, but that's how we got the blue for that to denote that you can start it, which is consistent with the ACIP recommendation. Dr. Lee. Just for simplicity, it would be great to think about other opportunities for harmonizing the adult and childhood. And for me, it's just the bottom boxes. And it doesn't really matter to me which direction, but I was noticing the wording is slightly different for the different for the same color across the childhood and adult. So if it would be okay to do that, that'd be terrific. Thank you. Yeah, we can certainly look at uh, how to best harmonize that while keeping the intent the same as it should be for both. Dr. Kimberlin. David Kimberlin, AAP. Uh, I, I realize it can't be uh, done across the entire table, um, but to channel Larry Pickering, the dash, uh, meaning whether it's to or through that particular year that follows the dash can be confusing. Uh, and so maybe a statement at some point in this document saying that a dash is inclusive of the year that follows the dash might be helpful. So we do have in the additional information section a bullet that says a dash should be interpreted as through. We have that present in the additional information section, but we can expand upon that bullet if, uh, if needed. You may not need to expand on it okay. at all, but it did, I, didn't, I did not notice it. Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? Uh, questions? Doc, Dr. O'Leary. Yeah, I just want to go back to the point about shared clinical decision making for HPV vaccine. I, I'm not sure what the right way to do that is, but um, you know we seem to be going down this this slippery slope of more and more shared clinical decision making. But in all the other cases, it's something that was voted upon at ACIP. In this case, you know, AAP recommends vaccination at this age. CDC sort of recommends vaccination, but it wasn't specifically in the language that it's shared clinical decision making. So mm. again, I don't know what the the best way to do that is, but in my mind, you know, yellow is almost better than shared clinical decision-making. Thank you for those comments. Um, Dr. Bernstein, now. Dr. Bernstein. 
So uh, along those lines, uh, Dr. O'Leary, I, I mean, I think that's a discussion and I think that's going to uh, perhaps be revisited at some, some time and different groups have different recommendations uh, around uh, HPV vaccine. Again, this schedule is, uh, we're creating the schedule not to make policy just what's, what's current recommendations from ACIP. And so actually the addition of the blue area is really allowed to, and to point out to people that it is an opportunity to give the uh, HPV vaccine at an earlier age, but it is not a yellow recommendation and that's not the current policy from ACIP. Uh, the, as a routine. Uh, the one other thing, the one other comment I wanted to make is with the child and adolescent uh, schedule, some of the notes that we have, rather than include a lot of text, we've included the links to the text and that might be helpful in the adult schedule because there seems to be an awful lot of narrative in the notes in the adult schedule and I think some of that could be abbreviated by giving the links which is what we tried to do in the child and adolescent schedule. Dr. Kahn. I apologize. Um, I did want to acknowledge though that um, we are trying to be consistent with just having the blue acknowledge where we specifically voted for shared clinical decision making. There's other parts in the schedule where it says you may do this or you may do that from prior to implementing the ETR framework. And so we, we should go back and think about what's the most consistent color for that specific recommendation. Um, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, for those of you who don't know, this is the chair of the flu, the CDC lead of the flu work group, and I asked her to come and answer the question of what, how we consider cochlear implants, because it wasn't really clear to me that we all understood. So, Lisa, you want to talk about that? Thank you. Um, the short answer is that cochlear implants and persistent CSF or pharyngeal cavity communications are considered um, what we call a do not recommend, which equals contraindication. Several years back, it became apparent that we have really only two labeled contraindications for LAIV use that are in the package insert, which are salicylate and aspirin use and um, severe hypersensitivity or anaphylaxis. But yet for a number of years, we've had other conditions for which we said don't use it. And it was suggested to us after several back and forths with other groups that we should say, have a concise table with a column that is contraindications, which also includes conditions in which should not be used. Immunocompromised conditions are included in there. That column does not specifically list under any immunocompromising conditions, the cochlear implants and the persistent CSF communications. However, it is noted in the text. I believe for next season, one thing that we can do is add those two things specifically to the table. Um, we do consider them a breach of immunity, and that is why they're in the do not recommend. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Freihofer. I have a question about um, the, the suggestion that more white lines be put on the adult schedule. And, and the question is, when we look at the child schedule, it says one dose, one dose, one dose. But on the adult schedule, it's, it's more we're not, they're just having to get kind of one. So I'm not sure if that would make it easier or more complicated. I want things to be easy. Thank you. Anyone else that I might have missed? Sir, can we let it no, it's over here. Dr. Coyle. Not to belabor the point on HPV, but I was trying to look through the recommendations just to make sure I understood where the shared clinical decision-making piece is. And I don't see anything in the recommendations, and I'm hopeful somebody can point me to where that, that was actually called out. For HPV in the RECs, it does not specifically say shared clinical decision-making. It just says you can start vaccination at age nine. Dr. So Kimberly. wouldn't that be indicated oh. by yellow then? Because it's we can within certainly, the, the range of, rec well, well, it can be. I'm seeing some mixed. Sorry. We can certainly have an uh, internal discussion here with uh, the S subject matter expert and our ACIP members um, and determine what's the best color for that box. So just to remind everyone, I think the plan now is going to be all of these comments are going to be considered and incorporated. Um, and then uh, we'll reschedule the vote for not right after lunch, but you'll see all of this before you have to um, make a motion for a vote. 
Dr. Kimberlin. David Kimberlin, AAP. This is, this is going to show my ignorance, but a question to follow up on the CSF communication or leakage following um, cochlear implantation. Is that a permanent leakage? It seems like they'd be dying right and left of bacterial meningitis if that was the case. Um, cochlear implant and persistent CSF communications are, are, are described as two separate things, um, not necessarily a CSF leak following a cochlear implant, if, if I understand the question correctly. But the, the do not recommend specifies persistent CSF um, or pharyngeal communications. Dr. Grosskopf, if so, I could. So that in, does a cochlear implant yield always yield those persistent CSF communications, I guess is my question. Well, can I just say that um, I just looked it up. But the incidence of CSF leak in cochlear implantation is reported to be between 1 and 5 percent in large case series. So I guess, are you just worried that these could be 1 to 5 percent of the kids with cochlear implants? But before you answer that question, let me just add one more thing to that. Is it, so in a recent discussion with, with our ENT specialists at, at our center, I was told that this question of the leak and associated problems with the CSF were, were, were more closely associated with the original types of, impl of cochlear implants that were used, and that this is not so much a problem today as it was in the past. So now, Dr. Groskopf. Dr. Sanchez wants to say something before. Thank you. No, with, I just, with regard to that. Yes, exactly. No, I, I want to echo that because it has been with the original um, and no longer with the current ones. But I, I think that needs to be stated clearly because um, I personally don't see it as a contraindication um, and do not recommend or do not use is a contraindication that, um, and if, if it's because we don't have the data, maybe that's what should be stated rather than that it should not be used. Dr. Groskopf, please. Thank you. Um, the, for those two conditions specifically, actually, there's a paragraph in the guidance that notes that there is a lack of data for those two conditions, and that because we have other vaccines available, that is the reason for it not being recommended. The work group did review this, um, these two topics uh, several years back, and at the time, the, the, the thinking was that there simply just wasn't enough data to move on it, and again, we have alternative vaccines. Um, so that was the logic for that. But at this point, this is something that, you know, we had been planning to take back to the work group and to assess whether more data were available. Thank you. Any other comments or anybody that I left off the list that wanted to make a comment? All right. Then we'll close the discussion and comment at this time. Um, if there are no objections uh, from the committee, then uh, we'd like to take a 10-minute break before entering public comment. We will have public comment for the immunization schedules today. Both immunization schedule voting will be moved till tomorrow. We will vote on the pertussis vaccine uh, issues today after lunch.